<laughs> oh my goodness. It is 2 p.m. everybody. Oh my goodness. It is time to begin. Welcome. Welcome everyone viewing. I am the host of this week, Michael Mankiewicz. Um, we are in for a very special episode. It is the 10th episode of our summer Zoom stage reading series that we do here with the BFA class of 2021. Um, before we begin, we have a nice little video to kind of commemorate the 10 episodes we've done so far. So first things first, we're going to get that video going and then we'll dive right in. Let me set it up. Boop. As, yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Hi, my name is Sam Summer. I'm here with the BFA class of 2021 at Baldwin Wallace to tell you thank you for watching Living Room Theater. Uh, we had this little section to kind of celebrate that this is our 10th episode. So we've been doing this for 10 weeks and I'm just going to give you a little bit of the history and what we have done so far and what to expect in the future. So keep watching. Bye. I'm Nathan Lopez Rando. Thank you so much for watching Living Room Theater. We've been in talks for a series of episodes where we just kind of read plays for a long time now, but the official starting point of Living Room Theater was April 11th, where we read scenes from The Crucible, as well as a surprise scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Ah! No, she's a witch. She looks like one. And as of right now, from when this video is po posted, it should be June 13th. So yeah. That's a long time, and we're still going. Uh, so for this quick little section, I just kind of want to share the names of everyone that's been doing this. Uh, we have Olivia Billings, Karis Brizendine, Paige Cummings, Bryce Edwards, Grace Favaro, Isabella Fay, Anthony Harris Jr., Brendan Harvey, Nathan Lopez Riando, uh, Nick, Nikki Madalena, Mike Mankiewicz, Alex Packard, Ryan Pangrass, <laughs> uh, Quinn Potter, Will Potts, Lindsay Shiner, Sam, that's me, Sam Summer, and Caroline Turner. Let's go on to the next person. Cool. Hello. Will Potts here. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for watching Living Room Theater. It means a lot. And thank you for the donations and thank you for everything. Living Room Theater is a free show to watch, but we do accept donations through our GoFundMe, where we use that money to go to, towards our, uh, our uh, senior showcase for next year. But as you probably have been watching, this month of June, we've been dedicating all of our donations to the Cleveland Protest Fund. And we were in talks about like charity and like what we can do with such a little group that we are. Uh, but we decided that every month from here on out, we are going to set up a GoFundMe. And pretty much all the money is, the money is said to go to us, but we are gonna have at the end of each month, 10% of that donation fund is going to go to a select charity that we choose for that month. So stay tuned to help a good cause, whatever it will be, the select month. Haha. <laughs> Pretty much we didn't want to just be like June and that's it. We want to help as much as we can. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to say a quick thank you for um, watching and supporting the BW BFA acting class of 2021, my class and watching our Living Room Theater series uh, these past 10 weeks during quarantine. Um, and for donating and supporting and giving us love and light, it's really, 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 really meant a lot to us. Um, so yeah, thank you. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching Living Room Theater and sticking with us for 10 weeks. And for the future of Living Room Theater, we plan to have more guests, more different types of shows. We're going to start spotlighting our playwrights that show up for each week. It's going to be a lot of fun, so stay tuned. It's going to be great. Uh, back to you, Mike Mankiewicz. Hey, go watch Shakespeare in the Dark. Bazinga. Thank you, <laughs> Sam, for that <laughs> lovely introduction back to me. But uh, for real, great video. So welcome everyone to our 10th episode. Yeah. For this week, we are going to be reading Shakespeare in the Dark, a comedy in two acts by Adam Harrell. Let's get down to this cast list real quick. So playing the role of Tina will be Grace Favaro, playing the role of Jennifer or Jen will be Paige Cummings. Playing the role of Abigail will be Caroline Turner. 
Our first special guest for today, uh, playing the role of Sybil, is Natalie Steen. Playing the role of Gloria Tillman will be our very own Bryce Edwards. Playing the role of Irwin will be Sam Summer. And our second special guest that we have today, uh, playing the role of Shakespeare, is uh, Laura Berg. <laughs> And last but not least, uh, playing the role of Paul will be Quinn Potter. And I am your host, Michael Mankiewicz. So I say we, uh, is everyone ready to dive right in? Ooh. Yeah. Last thing I want to say again, just to reiterate, um, any donations or anything you want to throw our way during this episode will all go to, for the entire month of June, we'll go to the Cleveland Protest Funds, a great cause. So if you want to support us, that's what we're supporting right now. All righty. So let's dive in. Act one, scene one. <clears throat> Setting, an empty stage inside the Tillman Theater, an old discrepant performance space from the heydays of vaudeville located in the recesses of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, New York, present day. The entire performance space stands in for the location which, uh, with actors freely using the house seats and bombs as they would in a typical rehearsal. At rise, Tina, a young actress dressed in a bulky Apollo space suit, uh, Apollo astronaut style spacesuit, enters the stage and begins delivering a monologue for Irwin, her director, who sits in the house with the audience to observe. Paul, the stage manager, also sits in the house, following along with a script. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after him. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault and grievously hath Caesar answered it. I'm sorry, can we stop? Well, Tina, Tina, that was going great. I'm, I'm sorry, Erwin. I'm having trouble moving in this thing. Plus it's itchy and the fingers on these gloves are so fat I can't keep my grip on my helmet. This scene takes place outside of Moonbase Rome among the plebs. It is vital that we show Mark Antony in the spacesuit. I'm confused though. You have me taking off my helmet in the middle of the speech. If we're outside of Moonbase Rome, how am I getting oxygen? I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 you're fine. Uh, like I explained at the table, we've got to imagine some giant acrylic bubble dome surrounding the moon base that give the colonists an outside to move around in. Uh, that's where you are. Well, then why am I even wearing this spacesuit in the first place? Sorry. No, 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 no you're totally fine. Uh, the spacesuits are your costumes. What about togas? Togas are easy. Couldn't we be wearing togas when we're not in the spacesuits? Atina, togas in space. <laughs> Don't you think that's a little far-fetched? I did. You're not happy. What's the matter? I'm sorry, Erwin. Maybe I'm not fully grasping your concept. Sorry. No, 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 no. It is fine. Questions are part of the process. This is healthy. In fact, let's have a timeout. Uh, let's get everyone out here. Uh, hey, everyone. Can you all join us on the stage, please? Jen, Sybil, Abigail. Uh, Paul, you are in the cast, too. Will you please join them? I literally play one part and have one line. You know who small parts, Paul? Only small actors. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Got everyone here. This is really terrific. Really great. All right. <laughs> it has come to my attention that some of you may be struggling with the concept of the show. How about everyone who still doesn't understand what we're going for here? Raise their hand. Oh, come on now. Don't be shy. Tell me what you guys really think. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess everyone is in the dark. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe we should have a powwow. That's racist. Uh, thank you, Abigail. Maybe we should have a discussion about the concept hmm? so I can clear any confusion. So I'll open the floor to comments and let's not hold back, shall we? Say what you really feel. Tina, you were already warmed up. Let's start with you. Thank you, Erwin. I guess what's bugging me the most is why does it have to be set on the moon? <laughs> I mean, I get that it's a cool concept, but what does that choice add to the story? Great question. And also, Julius Caesar has a very specific historical context. <laughs> yes, 
Uh, I too have serious misgivings about this production. Okay, one at a time, please. Nah, the team is right. The moon choice is arbitrary. It adds nothing. How does it add nothing? I mean, come on, NASA, space exploration, mankind's desire to face the frontier. Neil Armstrong, human preservation, perseverance. Uh, you're telling me that doesn't stir anything in you? It is a play about political assassination and intrigue. Space exploration is completely agnostic to it. Hmm, agree to a disagree. If Shakespeare were here to see this, he would puke along. Uh, Shakespeare's been dead for like 600 years. I don't see how that's relevant. 400. 400 years. Thank you, Abigail. Uh, point is, now it's someone else's turn. He wanted people like us to do the, this to his work. He says it himself right in the play. Uh, how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn in accents yet unknown? Mm, academic poppycock. Uh, give me a break, Civil. It is not the worst concept. It's jazzy, but it's brainless. Brainless? Okay. Uh, I'll add that to the list. Come on, there's got to be someone who liked it. Abigail, help me out. The concept I have no problem with. Thank you. What I have a problem with is working for a racist. Okay, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Rumors are flying, and we always want to be clear about what our actions are. For those who, you, oh, who don't know, an African-American gentleman accosted me on the street after rehearsal a few nights ago. He was only trying to sell you a CD. Well, I think I handled it as well as anyone could expect. You ran away screaming white genocide. Adrenaline does amazing things to the mind and body. Uh, we should all be paying attention to the real issue here, controlling our adrenaline levels in any situation. Plus, I have many black friends like Gregory. Did I ever introduce you guys to Gregory? Erwin, I don't think you're a racist, but it might help if you could make your concepts a bit clearer. <sighs> it's really not so complicated, you guys. Uh, you can't overthink it. Uh, Woman, women are underrepresented in theater, and this play is hot right now, politically relevant, not to mention royalty free. So I wanted to do a gender swap version set on the moon. Explain the politically relevant part. What exactly are we saying about politics? Guys, I just wanted to add something fun to the world. Do you remember fun? You had it as a kid. I mean, do I really need a reason? If you're calling it art, yes. Yeah. And sometimes when you're an artist, you have to make a choice and then understand it later. But this is later and we still don't understand. Mm, I'm talking about much later, maybe years later, maybe never. Never. Yes, never. The audience decides if it's good when the curtain goes up and that's all that matters. New beats old any day of the week, you guys. People aren't picky, they just don't want the same old thing. But why can't we make choices that are both new and good? Sorry. Don't, don't be sorry. That's an excellent question. It would be nice to have a fully formed concept, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to just dive into the unknown. Like you can't play it risky and safe at the same time. So you're admitting the concept is half-baked. I am saying you have to leave some room for improvisation or you suck out all the air out of it, uh, Sybil. All the life. Regardless, there are a lot of other choices you could have made that would have made more logical sense. I have to agree. <laughs> Me too. Yep. You know, guys, I don't know what to tell you. They're called plays because you're supposed to play with them. I'm just gonna have to ask everyone to give it the old college try. I had to sit for three hours tonight doing nothing in this itchy space suit. Your rehearsals have gone increasingly off the rails, Erwin. <laughs> your choices are arbitrary, your directions are vague, and you are comically underprepared. And I believe you are just making it up as you go, wasting everyone's time and energy while indulging your own ego. Thanks, Sybil. Don't hold back next time. I have another different question. Uh, yes, Jen. Um, are, are there any updates? Uh, on our Portia? Is, is he ever returning to rehearsals? Oh, uh, I don't know. Paul? Uh, yeah. Did you call Jake? What's going on with him? Oh, yeah. He quit. Why? Something about not liking the concept. When did this happen? Uh, last Saturday. Were you planning on telling me? I meant to write it down. There you go. 
Uh, well, are we gonna recast the part or are we planning on cutting it? Cut it. Thank you, Paul, for the update. Anytime. Cutting Portia? How is this gonna work? It'll work how it works, Sybil. I don't have a script in front of me. Because you lost it. Misplaced it. How many times do I have to freaking... Look, it's getting late, so why don't we call it a night? To be continued. Great job, everyone. Thank you for all this feel feedback, really. It was enlightening. Hang your spacesuits up in the back. Get home safe. We'll see you on Friday to work on the big scene. <laughs> Act three, scene one. The assassination of Caesar. A two brute. <laughs> Jen, Abigail, Tina, and Sybil all exit. Paul returns to his sound light boards. Erwin packs a satchel up to leave for a few beats. Then Tina re-enters, dressed in street clothes. Paul watches them with envy. Want to know my favorite thing you ever taught me? Uh, Tina, I uh, didn't see you there. Sure, uh, what? Wipe your feet before you go into rehearsal and again before you leave. That stuck with me. That's great. I still do appreciate the opportunity to be in the show, despite the impression I gave earlier. No, you, you didn't give an impression like that. It, it's a collaborative art. That's what it's all about. Don't sweat it. Thank you, Erwin. It's so hard to find strong female roles in this town, and Mark Anthony is such a great showcase for my talents. Oh, I have to show you my new headshot soon. <laughs> yes, you should show me on Friday. Yeah. Well, hey, I know you're busy, and... You have to take two trains, but I could use a drink if you don't mind hanging around. We could hit the pub across the street. One drink. Wow, Tina. Uh... The moon concept is a bit arbitrary, if you ask me. Paul, what, what are you referring to the play? Are you, you, said, you said the floor is open. That, that was like a year ago. The, Paul, rehearsal is over. Where have you been? It took me a while to think of something. Well, you snooze, you lose. What can I say? Ha! <sighs> ah. Uh, your concerns are duly noted. Thanks for your input. Question about Act 5. How are we going to stage the Battle of Philippi on the lunar surface with none of the chief combatants? Friday, Paul! Let's talk Friday! Tina, I'm so sorry. Gonna have to take a rain check. My cats have been alone in the apartment all day, and I'm gonna catch hell for it. That's okay. The moment was interrupted. I'm available to hang out if you want to talk shop. Who have to stay here tonight and set up the light board, Paul. Oh, I'll take a rain check too then. Oh, sorry, all out of those. <laughs> See you Friday. Have a good night, Erwin. Yep, be safe. Dude, what's your secret? What? What do you mean? Women can't get enough of you. I don't know about that. I've been divorced twice. Maybe that's it. I doubt it. I'm no good with words, man. I get all clammy around girls. Help me out. It's not about words. Young ladies are, who are actresses sometimes become enamored with their mentors. Nothing new there. Yeah, but Tina likes you. So? How do I get Tina to like me? I don't know how to get a woman to do anything, Paul. I'm a director, not a matchmaker. And this is an awkward conversation. Yeah. Good talk. Thank you. Please, for the love of God, that is good and holy. Remember to lock up before you leave. It was not fun evicting that group of squatters last week. They had bicycle chains. Yeah. I am putting the keys right here. No flaking. Dude, I will lock the door. Great. Thanks. Sybil enters the stage in street clothes, heading out of the theater for the night down one of the bombs. Jen is in close pursuit, also in street clothes. Jen, what is the point of you doing my laundry if you can't bring it to rehearsal? I, I'm really sorry, Sybil. I'm cramming for finals this week. Things are just so crazy and I forgot. It's all done though. Should be at my place. Bring it to my building and drop it off with my doorman tomorrow morning. Before nine, I have an audition and I need my chiffon jumper. You got it. Or since you live on the west side, maybe we could just share a car. Maybe you could stop by my place and get it. Maybe we could also open a bottle, bottle of Merlot and watch old Humphrey Bogart movies. Maybe some other time when I'm not carrying the attention of a war-torn village. Oh, massage time! Yes. Lower. Mm. Whenever I feel frustrated with the world, I take a deep breath and count to five and think, how can I be happier with what's right in front of me? 
what is there to be so happy about? No hot water or microwaves, warped floorboards, hundred year old riggings that may snap at any minute. <laughs> I used to have my own private dressing room, my own personal stylist, flowers in the green room. There were autographs, drinks, backstage romances. I was a star. Now I'm playing Julius Caesar in space. Well, I never agreed to do such god awful dreck. I'm standing right here. Ugh, who cares anymore, Erwin, you fat sack? Wow, okay. Sybil! I trained at Juilliard! My Viola in Twelfth Night was the toast of Skokie, Illinois. I have reached the nadar of my career thanks to you. Is this because we didn't get to your scenes tonight? Perhaps if we hadn't spent an hour arguing over the physics of gravity boots, but alas. Why don't you go home and hop in the tub? Uh, seriously, no one's asking you to stick around. <laughs> See you Friday then? Okay, thanks. Have a good one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, alive. Mm -hmm. You're not about to harangue me with something, are you? Oh, no, Erwin, I, I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> right, right, sorry. Sorry, Jen, I, I just getting so wound up. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way, but how is that a person like you spends so much time around a person like Sybil? Well, I mean, it's Sybil Danning we're talking about. The Sybil Danning. She's got seven Tony nominations. The show is like the most amazing work study program ever. I'm learning so much. Yeah, she was a big deal back in the day. No, you don't understand, Erwin. When I was six, my parents took me to New York to see her show on Broadway, The Glass Menagerie. Sybil was playing Laura at the height of her career. After her performance, I knew without a shred of a doubt that I wanted to be an actress. She's the whole reason I'm even here. When I saw that I was gonna be in the show with her, I was beside myself. This is like my whole life coming full circle at age 24 and it's all thanks to you. Wow, thank you, thank you, Jen. Wow, <laughs> I can always count on you for some positivity. Oh, I can't help that I was born this way. But, but still, not, not to be rude or anything, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's an alcoholic. Oh, almost certainly. <laughs> she says she drinks to drown out the voices of all the roles she's played. Seems convenient. Look, just be careful, okay? Don't forget to stand up for yourself. <laughs> you too. I, I mean, yes. <laughs> Get home safe. Jen exits the theater. Erwin goes off to turn the house lights off, which extinguish with an audible whine, leaving Paul with his work lamps on. Erwin re-enters. You know what, Paul? Why don't you go home too? Call it a night. Really? Yeah, uh, don't worry. I'll lock things up. It was a long rehearsal. It's late. You get the board running next time. Positive? Yeah. I've been kind of a tight wad lately. Maybe everyone was right. I mean, what are we even doing here? Is it just an arbitrary exercise? Will it make any kind of lasting impact on the world? Is it any good? It's art. Can you really call it art when nobody is connecting to the work, including me? You should be more concerned about how you're gonna pay us. Working on that. Pre-sales haven't exactly been taking off. Uh, don't worry, all in all, this will be good experience for you. Oh, great. I can take that to the experience bank and deposit into my experience account. Then I'll write my landlord an experience check for my rent. That's how that works, right? Are you going to take up, me up on the offer or what? Yes. Have a good night, Paul. Be a pal and don't share our financial woes with the rest of the cast until I get it all figured out. Roger. Oh, uh, and I'm going to need you to double up as Portia. Think you can memorize those lines by next week? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Erwin. I mean, I don't have a paying job or social life on the weekend, so it'll be easy to memorize the largest female role in the play on top of my other duties. Was that sarcasm? Yes. Please just help me out here, Paul. Hey, uh, it means more FaceTime with Tina, eh? I feel like this is a trick, but okay. All right, thanks, buddy. Have a good one. Yep. Paul exits. As Erwin goes to exit, Abigail enters, wheeling out an illuminated ghost light to center stage. Hey, 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 well, are you the one who's been leaving this on at night? It's the ghost light. You're supposed to leave it on at night for the theater ghosts. I know what a ghost light is, but we can't have one on this production. 
that's wrong. You can't do that. It's against tradition. Oh, tradition is not unimpeachable. Ancient Mayans had a tradition of playing basketball with the severed heads of their enemies. Should we bring that one back too? What? Forget it. Um, Abigail, Mrs. Tillman has been complaining about the Con Ed bill. We're not supposed to leave anything on at night. I'm afraid tradition has to reckon with reality. What kind of Scrooge would refuse to turn on the ghost light? The kind like me. The mediocre, struggling, latently racist theater director type. But- I'm all for theater tradition, okay? This is about practicality and money that we do not have. It's one little light. A production should have some mystery, some magic. It can't be all nuts and bolts. It has to have heart, romance. I do have a heart and I do have a sense of romance, I assure you. But the decision is above my head and I also don't believe in ghosts. I knew you were a non-sensitive. Abigail, you're talking about rules and superstitions made up by white males in frilly pants hundreds of years ago. How does that fit with any of your politics? It's not about personal politics. You're tempting fate. You'll anger the theater gods. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? Erwin. The answer is no, Abigail. And I have a funny feeling we'll be okay. If we do end up getting a poltergeist, you can say I told you so. It's almost like you're trying to curse this production. You're trying to exercise anything magical, enlightening, or connected to the artists who came before us. Then why don't you quit already, huh? It, it, it seems to be the thing to do lately. If it's so bad and I'm so terrible, if you don't have your tutti fruity connection to the artists before us, why, why not? I, I only have three grand of my own dumped into it. <sighs> okay, no, please don't quit. I need you, you're my Brutus. I had no right to blow up like that. It's, it's just my own frustrations. This play has got me at my wit's end. We go into tech in a week and nothing is working. You're right, Abigail. The theater magic is very important. We can't forget the magic. We will leave the ghost light on. That's all I wanted. Please forget about my terrible behavior if you can and get home safe. We'll try again Friday. Okay. Damn it. Erwin looks at the ghost light, then checks to see if Abigail is gone. Once the close is cleared, he shuts off the ghost light, leaving everything dark, and exits the theater. We hear him close the large metal exit doors and lock them. After he is gone, the ghost light flickers briefly, illuminating on its own accord, emanating strange electrical hums before going out again. A beat passes. Magical purple and blue lights swirl around the ghost light, and the crackling sound of electricity courses through the walls of the old theater. The bulb on the light glows brighter and brighter until the stage is completely illuminated. A loud electric crack rings out, and the ghost light dims back down to a normal level. William Shakespeare, a daguerreotype dressed in his period clothes, enters from the upstage darkness and gravitates towards the ghost light so we can catch a glimpse of his face. To be or not to be. Act one, scene two. Setting, the Tillman Theater stage the following Friday night at the next rehearsal. At Rise, Irwin is addressing Jen, Sybil, Abigail, Tina, and Paul from the stage as they sit in the house. Irwin has a new t-shirt on, a black one with, no, uh, with Poe Buddy's Nerfect <laughs> printed across the chest in large white letters. Welcome back, everyone. As you can see, I have a new shirt today, and I got this shirt for a reason, and that is to communicate or show you guys that everyone makes mistakes. Poe Buddy's Nerfect, <laughs> which I think is a clever way to express that, since there is a mistake right there in it. So as we charge ahead, I don't want any of us to be afraid to make mistakes or admit to mistakes. How does that sound, Simpatico? Yes, Paul. This morning, I accidentally jumped into the shower with my socks on. I meant mistakes we make during the rehearsal process, Paul, not your everyday mistakes. Okay? Is everyone clear on this? Mm -hmm. You guys, I'm on all your sides. I want to make this a terrific show for each and every one of you, especially you, Sybil. Without warning, a sandbag dangling above snaps and falls, making a direct hit on Sybil, 
thudding on her head and tossing her out of her chair, making everyone jump up in fright. Oh, hell! Sybil, dear God! What was that? Oh my gosh, is she okay? Sybil, Sybil, speak to me, Sybil. I'm fine! Mm, back from the old fly rail system. Oh no. Oh, Sybil, Sybil, do you need some water or some ice? Paul, hurry, run and go get me some water, a bag of ice, a cold compress, some aspirin, a few towels. I do not need towels. Everyone back away! Should we call an ambulance? Don't be a child. You can have a concussion. I think I would know if I had a concussion. So the problem is this miserable theater and I, it should have been condemned 40 years ago. No Tony award winning nominee should have to endure these conditions. Some of the vaudeville greats have trod these boards. Sir John Galgood himself played Hamlet here. The Tillman was a hot theater spot in its heyday. Is that really important right now? What did I say? Sybil. Are you sure you don't need anything? I need something with gin in it. Oh, I'll help you with anything. What can I do? No, gin as in liquor, as in mix it with tonic. Oh, one gin and tonic coming right up. Make it a martini. Oh, good choice. Whoa, excuse me. <laughs> Nobody is having a mixed drink during rehearsal. Where do you think you're going? I say Sybil can handle a little art through adversity. Right, Sybil? This is the most low-rent Mickey Mouse production I've ever been a part of. I urge you to read and reread the message on the shirt I am wearing. <laughs> Do you need medical attention? Because all I care about at this moment is your safety. No, thank you, but some aspirin would help before I hop into my space suit. Great. <laughs> Paul, go grab some aspirin from my bag. I have like three bottles in there. Oh, I can do it. No, let Paul. Oh, but I'm already up. I need you here, Jen. Oh, it will only take a second. Oh, fine, fine, go ahead. Mm. Nice. Now, if it's at all possible, I'd like to get started on working Act 3, Scene 1, a very important scene, barring any other further interruptions. Ah! The hell was that? What happened? This place is haunted. Like, Legit haunted. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, Abigail. What are you talking about? A, a voice? I, I heard a voice. There were a lot of people talking out here. I know what I heard, and it wasn't anyone here. Erwin, she's white as a sheet. Okay, okay. Take us through it. I was curious about the sandbag, so I followed the rope over to the stage right wing, and I was standing there looking at the pulleys. Okay, Sadie, you can tell us. I felt a voice, like some person with ice cold breath was right up beside my ear. It whispered to me. Say. I remember every word. Fortune is not bestowed on fools. Men are the slaves fortune makes fools of. And you're sure it was nobody here? Unless anyone here is capable of making echo and reverb effects with their voice alone and just hasn't shared it previously. Fortune is not bestowed on fools. Where do I know that from? Romeo and Juliet. It's Romeo's fortune fool monologue. Oh, I am a fortune's fool. Right. Wait, the ghost whispered a line from Romeo and Juliet to you? <laughs> We're saying it's a ghost now. You guys, it was definitely a ghost. It's not a ghost. Well, how else would you explain it? Uh, uh, this theater is very old. Lots of creaky floorboards. I'll bet the foundation settles a lot. So the old floorboards and the building settling created noises that combined in such a way to sound like complete sentences from a major literary work? Look, I don't want to say anything is anything right now. We don't have enough information. We just know that some... Crazy coincidences have happened. Did you leave the ghost light on after I left Wednesday night? What? You were the last one to leave. What's this about? He wanted to turn it off to save on the power bill. It can't add that much to the power bill, can it? <sighs> Cheap, classless, and boneheaded. I made a management decision, all right, Civil? So you did turn it off after you said you wouldn't. 
I'm sorry to break it to you folks, but there is no such thing as theater magic and ghosts, okay? This is real life, and in real life, there's Gloria Tillman, the ornery blue-haired lady who owns the deed to this theater. You told me you believed in theater magic, liar. For the record, I said theater magic is important, not that I believed in it. No ghost light for Shakespeare in a place like this. Erwin, are you insane? Oh, dude, come on. What grades are we all in? Listen to how you all sound. Is, how is this rational? No more rational than that ridiculous t-shirt you're wearing which I will once again remind you to read in earnest. Or the choice to set the play on the moon. Come on, you all cannot seriously think that me leaving the ghost light off caused all this, can you? How many productions have you been a part of that even had a ghost light? This is madness. Another sandbag snaps and drops from above, this time striking Irwin in the head, sending him crashing to the floor. Everybody gasps, but he immediately springs back up, eager to show he is okay. Nothing! That was nothing. I'm fine. All good. What did I tell you? It's an old space. It's got character. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. Ah, wow. That'll wake you up. <laughs> mm, Paul, you want to fetch me some more of that aspirin? Can't Jen do it? Anyone, please. I'll do it, Erwin. Thank you. Now, enough lollygagging. We've got work, scene work, and we're burning up studio time. We're continuing rehearsals? The show must go on. How's that for theater magic, Abigail? Go have a talk with your pixies and find the magic to do the work. Erwin, can I? Everyone, please get into their spacesuits. Except for you, Paul, you put on the bathrobe. That smelly thing. Oh, now, all of you. All actors exit uh, to change with no further protest. Erwin is left alone. He takes a seat in the house, rubbing his head. Here you go. <laughs> sure you're all right? Right as rain. Don't worry. Everyone's getting into costume and we're going to start the scene. Sounds good. Nina begins to exit towards the dressing room. As she does, a foreboding voice from the ether appears to Irwin. Beware the Ides of March. Hmm? You say something? Me? No. Why? What did you hear? Nothing. Erwin, are you sure? Positive, don't worry, go get changed. Tina continues out as Paul re-enters, now dressed in a gray bathrobe as the soothsayer. He carries a broom as a walking stick. Whoa, 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 Paul, what, what is this? A proper soothsayer always carries a walking stick. Well, that's a broom. Well, Paul Buddy's nerfed. Please get rid of it. Paul tosses the broom aside. Tina? Uh, Archidormus, Sybil, Caesar, Jen, Cassus, and Abigail Brutus all trickle back on stage dressed in their bulky spacesuits. Great. Uh, everyone looks terrific. <laughs> now, it's our first time blocking the scene, so I'm just going to let you guys play around and follow your impulses. But I'll give you a little motivation to start. Uh, Sybil, you're Caesar. You're surrounded by conspirators, and on a day of celebration on the moon base, yet you can't trust anyone. Things are confusing and bewildering. Tina, you are doubling up as Ard, 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 Thank you. You are a crazy political fringe, Yahoo. Probably whacked out on meth or something. You've got a petition you want Caesar to read. Got it. <laughs> Jen, as Cassius, you are one of Caesar's best friends and advisors, and you are also a treacherous dog. You know what's about to go down. It's your job to make sure it all goes down right. <laughs> <laughs> and Abigail, Brutus, you're Caesar's friend too, and you're the most torn up about all this. This is the moment of truth. Let me see the horror. Let me see the sweat. And do. <laughs> all right, that, that about does it. What about me? You have one line, Paul. I still need some motivation. Hobble on, say your line, then hobble off. All righty, let's get going here. You're all entering together, just like we're at the globe. <laughs> and lights up. Th that means begin, please. The actors enter the stage in a tight group. Sybil puts on her best bewildered and confused face on as she wanders up to Paul, who is hobbled over. 
The Ides of March are come. Ah, Caesar, but not gone. Wait, stop. Paul, what is that accent? Are, are you a pirate? Did you, did you add an R at the beginning? I'm a space pirate. Please do it again in a normal voice. I Caesar, but not gone. Thank you, keep going. Hail Caesar, read this schedule. Um, I don't have a schedule. We'll get you something to hold. Keep going. And remember, we cut Decius out completely, so just skip his lines. Okay. Oh, Caesar, read mine petition first for mine's a suit. Um, line. Paul? I'm in the sea. Right, okay. Uh, what's the line, anyone? I still don't have my script in front of me. Anyone at all? Just call it out for Tina. You're just asking us what the line is. Yeah, isn't it a, isn't it like a, something about touching Caesar? I think it's that touches Caesar nearer. That touches Caesar nearer. Read it, great Caesar. Bingo. Continue. What touches us ourselves shall be last served. Delay not, Caesar. Read it instantly. What is this fellow mad? What urged you your petitions in the streets? Come to the capital. Okay, move over to the Senate chambers in a bunch. The actors move as a tight group to another part of the stage. When they do, a cluster of sandbags falls and hits the floor where they once stood. They all regard it, then look to Irwin. Never mind that now. Pretend like it didn't happen and keep going. <clears throat> what said Popilius Lena? If he wished today our enterprise might thrive, I fear our purpose is discovered. Look how he makes to Caesar. Mark him. Brutus, what shall be done? If this be known, Cassius or Caesar never shall turn back, for I will slay myself. Without warning, the power in the building shuts off with an audible whine. We can still see the actors in a faint blue light. Okay, what now? No power? Paul, what's going on? What should I know? Great. Good thing you left the ghost light off. Not <laughs> now, Abigail. I suppose this means we won't be getting to my death scene. Erwin. I'm scared. Do, do you think it has something to do with the ghost? I, I, I mean, with the creaky voice? It's probably just a blown breaker in the fuse box. This place is old, like I keep telling you. Get out. Everyone except Erwin screams in terror. Then they scatter out of the building like cockroaches. Hey, 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 no, okay, okay. Nobody panic, nobody panic. Mm. Ah. Act one, scene three, setting. The Tillman Theater main stage several minutes later. At Rise, Irwin, armed with a crowbar and a flashlight, is carefully entering the theater, sent in by others to inspect. The ghost light sits center stage, unseen to him. All right, I'm going down to the basement to flip the breaker. It's, I'd better not get hit by anything on my way down. <laughs> I don't even believe in ghosts, by the way. I think this is all one big coincidence. Mm. There is no such thing as theater magic either. That's just the fairy tale stuff that they shove on young people so they don't argue with unpaid internships. Mm. I'm not scared. I have this crowbar, but I'm not scared. Mm. Can't be scared of something that is not real. The ghost light illuminates, revealing William Shakespeare standing right next to Irwin. We tend to manifest the things that frighten us the most, do we not? Yeah! You're, you're, uh, you're, holy, uh, uh, stay back! Without thinking, whack Shakespeare with his crowbar, who is impervious to it. The resulting vibrations injure Irwin's hand, forcing him to drop the weapon. Oh, holy mother of God. What, what are you, made of metal? Imagine my shock. There I was, enjoying the afterlife, blissfully unaware that anything had transpired over the last four centuries, floating above and beyond the wretched world. Now, I am here because somebody neglected to leave the ghost light on. Give me a break. Are you serious? I make no levities in this moment, Sira. Uh, who are you anyway? That should be evident. Well, I'm not making the connection, pal. The immortal bard? 
not of an age, but for all time? Ring a bell? William Shakespeare, you poltroon. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, William Shakespeare, huh? Yeah, wow. Hmm. Hey, that's a good one. Who, who put you up to this? Was it Mark? This is some kind of payback for when I filled his car with packing peanuts, isn't it? Wow, yeah. You really went all out hiring an actor and everything. I'm no player. This is no game of peanuts, and I do not jest. <laughs> I do not jest. Wow. That's perfect. Okay, joke's over. Come on out, Mark. Uh, what are you, wearing a flak jacket under there? The costume is great, too. It looks authentic. Everything down to the silly collar. Erwin reaches out to sample the collar, but Shakespeare swats his hand away. This is my lucky collar. Enough dilly-dally. You are desecrating my work, and I demand that you cease immediately or suffer the most baleful curse I can muster. Okay, buddy, don't you think you're taking the performance a little too far? Imbecile, this is no performance. Who do you think was causing all the rancor earlier? The falling bags, the haunting voices. It was I, William Shakespeare, I have returned as a powerful apparition, observe. Shakespeare flourishes and the power is restored to the theater. Hey, whoa, what, what the? Are you a patron of ventriloquism? Huh? Beware the Ides of March. Wait, uh? Shakespeare snaps his fingers, cueing another sandbag to fall on Erwin's head. He collapses to the ground and gets back up almost instantly. Okay, I get it. <laughs> What are you doing here? That should be evident as well. I've been recalled to these auspicious surroundings to save one of my plays, the dearest of all my little goslings, from being butchered by rank amateurs. Uh, uh, amateurs? Hmm. I've been doing this for 20 years, friend, and we've got some good kids on the show. I do not make my claim without evidence. This belongs to you, correct? Erwin... Flattermeyer. My script, where did you find that? Seeing as I'm apparently unable to leave the confines of this theater, I had time to burn last night, so I went over your notes. You call yourself the director. Do you play any roles? No, the actors play the roles. I just help them understand it better. This is the playwright's job. Well, the playwright is dead, uh, no offense. No other playwrights are available? Things are different these days. Most every play has a director, and the playwrights, well, they're not always encouraged to be at every rehearsal. Of course. Why would you encourage the craftsmen to participate in the craft? I'm not saying it's right. No matter. I'm not even worried about that because you have reduced my cast size by 30. <laughs> Mr. Shakespeare, you might have noticed there ain't a lot of money or resources in this biz, unless you happen to know Barry Dipshit down at the Grand Bullcrap Theater who owes you a favor. You gotta go small in today's independent game. Then my God, man, why choose Caesar? This play is the opposite of small. It extols the epic tale of one of the most divisive events in history since the beginning of time. An event that had heralded unprecedented dark age of civil war and disillusion. It deserves pageantry, a grand scale. You know, we're trying something here and I don't expect you to understand. <laughs> We are well beyond your conceptual choices. Fundamental story elements are missing. For instance, how do you plan to stage the Battle of Philippi with none of the chief combatants? I haven't gone to that yet. There are entire scenes missing. Character arcs are in shambles. Mm -hmm. The play has been cut to the quick. What do you call this prospecting, prospecting mess? Uh, how, how can I put this? Uh a lot has changed since you were, went into the dirt. dirt. Uh, everybody is a lot more distracted these days. A lot of the stuff you wrote is, well, boring to a lot of modern audiences, especially young people. The long intros and outros, a lot of the little scenes and side soliloquies that are frivolous, frankly, it's a snooze fest. Plays can't be four hours long anymore. They gotta be 90 minutes and all action. Don't get me wrong, uh, all that stuff is really good, but pretty much everyone who does your plays, at, at least in my peer group, cuts a good majority of those bits out. I never approved those cuts. Yeah, but like I said, the dialogue- The dialogue is fine. There's nothing wrong with the dialogue. <laughs> nothing at all, just, just a little antiquated. Then perhaps it's time has passed, has passed. 
perhaps you should stop serving it a death by a thousand cuts and move on to more urgent stories. Verily, you might write your own version that better reflects modernity. People do what they want, man. And people really love your play still. What, what do you expect? Nevertheless. You know, honestly, I thought you would be more okay with people doing your work 400 years after your death. Should I be celebrating? If I'm so beloved in your age, how is this mass violation of my work allowed? Have you no sense of decorum in this society? It's called public domain. Indeed. What is that? It, it's just rules, uh, laws in our time that say when an artist has been dead for a long time, other artists can do whatever they want to their life's work with no consequence. What sort of twisted netherworld have I arrived at? Lower East Side of Manhattan, New York. New York? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, New Amsterdam to you. We call it New York in the future. Why did they change it? I cannot say. Uh, uh, people must have liked it better that way. Astonishing. Four centuries pass, and I have become both remembered and forgotten. <laughs> the play I opened the globe with is being performed an ocean away, mangled beyond recognition. Oh, sweet irony. I suckle at your ample bosom once more. That's a bit defeatist. You should give my concept a shot. It ain't all that bad. Uh, we set it on the moon. Oh, and should I say, I should say that a man has been to the moon since you've been gone. So it's less far out than it seems. Man has visited the moon? <laughs> Multiple times uh, with great big rocket ships. Oh man, you should have seen it. Caesar has a very specific historical context. Yes, I am aware. But that's something else people do with your stuff. They change the settings and costumes and do mashups of, 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 of pop culture. Like they'll do Taming of the Shrew in the Wild West or, or Much Ado About Nothing do a, during a zombie apocalypse. Fun stuff. Who or what is a zombie apocalypse? Pop culture? The Wild West? What insipid interlocution is this? Come again? No matter. Your moon concept must explain those ridiculous puffy costumes. A lot of thought went into those costumes. From what I surmise, you and thought are unhappy bedfellows. Hey! That was an insult, right? If the costumes couldn't be simpler. Togas. Togas, togas, togas. How long did it take you to craft these monstrosities? Monstrosities? Why are you wasting precious? Just energy and time on such inconsequential aspects of the story. Well, they seem pretty consequential to you. As well they should. I wrote the bloody thing. I produced it with my own company of the finest actors in all of England, in the heart of London, without the assistance of a director. The words on those pages are my pedigree from my heart, wrought through my labours, not yours. You are conspicuous inspiring to make your own mark on them. Credit without labor, glory without sacrifice. Hear me well, I shall die before I let you take my name. Don't you think you're being a little dramatic? Of course I'm being dramatic. I'm William Shakespeare. Uh, hey, Erwin, are you okay? Some of us are getting a little worried out here. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, come on in everyone. It's safe, the power is back on. Sybil, Abigail, Jen, Tina, and Paul make their way back into the theater, joining Irwin and Shakespeare on stage. Is the Renaissance Fair in town? Uh, yeah, guys, this is, uh, this is the ghost that was bothering us. It's uh, the ghost of William Shakespeare, if you can believe it, our author. Oh, wow. Get out. No. Hey. William Shakespeare? The William Shakespeare? Oh my god, this is amazing! Well, he's kind of a dick, actually, so don't get too excited. Will you sign my script? Yes, my dear. As soon as you conjure a magical quill that doesn't require me to carry an inkwell around in my pocket. Here, it's a ballpoint pen. A ballpoint, eh? Just click the end. And now it writes? Yeah, just go for it. Feels as if I'm writing on soft cheese. Remarkable. May I keep it? 
It would be my honor, sir. I really love your plays. I especially love your romantic comedies. I, I love how you start with all the estranged couples and weave them together in the end and everyone pairs off in unexpected ways. Like you are the master of that. Like in A Midsummer Night's Dream, that is like my favorite of yours. Then it is I who am honored. Thank you. Oh my. Your Shakespeare took my pen. Thank you. Rude. You're one to talk. Erwin, I actually respect some things. I believe mystery is important. Yeah, and I thought you didn't believe in ghosts anyway. I believe in getting my money's worth out of studio time. <laughs> Money is all you care about. Yeah, well, I work in the theater. Our successes are our own, and so are our failures. If you cannot make your work, if you cannot make your way in this profession, perhaps it is time to try another. Fortune is not bestowed on fools. Oh, that makes total sense now. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, yeah. Real clever, all right. Nice play, Shakespeare. You got, you sure got me good. Guess we all can't be the world's most famous dram dramatist. Wow, how much courage does it take for Queen Elizabeth's golden boy to say that a no to a nobody like me? Zero. It takes zero courage. You know what does? Doing something that nobody wants you to succeed at, risking your entire pathetic reputation on something that only you believe in and nobody else around you does. That's courage. That's risk. That's what art is about. Some artists are just too well fed and pampered to see it. You take no risk saying that to me. Erwin, let's relax. Don't tell me to relax. This jerk came into my space, started messing with my cast, and is interrupting my show. I don't care if he's Caesar's ghost himself. He doesn't get a free pass for that. You talk about taking risks? What real risks have you actually taken, Erwin? You fancy yourself a creator, but what have you ever created? If anything, you've reduced, butchered, and diminished the work of others. No, my friend, you are a master of mediocrity. You take what others have done and you smash it apart, desperate for its secrets, willing to prostitute your soul to feel what creation is truly like because you are incapable of it. Oh, how droll. Maybe you didn't hear me before, but we are actually improving your play. Interrogative. Have you ever written a play? What? Have you? ever written a play. From start to finish, from beginning to end, no false starts or finishes. Hmm? Surely you must have attempted to find out for yourself what it takes to do the work before improving upon someone else's? I'm not a playwright if that's what you mean. So the answer is no. You have never excised a part of yourself and watched it bleed on stage. Well, when you put it that way, Hardly surprising. Any hack can do what you do, Erwin. Any fool can quarter something and rearrange the pieces. You know nothing about the real risks and sacrifices a real artist must make. You're a titanic fraud. That's crazy. <laughs> Is it? The cuts to the script are incomprehensible and you've no idea what you are doing with my play, admit it. No, because it's a lie. It's the truth. I am an artist. You're a fraud. Say it. <laughs> no. Yes. Maybe. Definitely. All right, all right, all right. You win, Mr. Big Shit, Mr. Pantaloons. You win. I am a fraud. Everyone get that? A fraud, just like he said. I've been coasting with this production with my whole career and my heart's not in it. Truth is, I'm terrified of sharing my ideas, but I need to do... I need to, like an idiot, so I try to force them into places it doesn't belong. I really should be pumping sour cream on burritos somewhere. I can't direct, I can't create, I've wasted my life. Oh, oh God, don't, don't look at me. He also can't pay us. Fuck, Paul! You said not to mention it to the rest of the cast. <laughs> my bad. Even if I had told you that, why would you choose now? Erwin. Is this true, Erwin? Yes, Sybil, go on and say something terrible about me. And the only reason I was even sticking around was for the paycheck. There you go. Okay, everyone just give Erwin some space for a second. Can't you see he's hurting? He must, 
it must be a very hard thing for him to admit. We're all artists here. Let's have a little compassion, huh? Theater is a collaborative art form. You know, guys, it never takes just one person to put on a show. Rule number one is we've all got to wipe our feet before we go into rehearsals and wipe our feet before we leave. At the end of the day, it's a job of work. Mr. Shakespeare, wouldn't you agree? Yes. Okay, so maybe we turn the dramatics down and think about this rationally. We still have a show to do, don't we? It might be like a really desperate situation, but there's still time to change that. Look at this incredible opportunity we all have. I mean, William Shakespeare himself is back as a ghost and living in our rehearsal space. Have we all become so cynical that we can't appreciate what's happening here? Thank you, Tina. We should all be so thankful for this. I'm beyond words. I think it's amazing. What do you, what do you think, Sybil? It is pretty weird. Are we? Yeah, sure. Mr. Shakespeare, we, we pay for this space by the hour. We only have a 90 minute time slot to perform and Irwin's right, we have to be frugal in all areas of production. These are the realities of the business. Even in your time, you had to make cuts and changes at the last minute to make it all work, I'm sure. Yes, yes, of course we did. Please understand, this is all very strange to me. One minute I'm enjoying a stein of mead with Burbage in the afterlife. The next minute I'm watching my life's work being ripped apart by wild dogs. Help us then. If it's so wrong what Irwin did to your play, make it right. I mean, who else could possibly make it right for us the way you could? This might be your entire purpose for being here. It's unwise to ignore the signs the universe gives you. Yeah. And I'm taking a Shakespeare course at Tisch this semester, and it'd be so great just to observe you. That sounded really creepy, but it's totally sincere. How long until opening night? Two weeks, six rehearsals, not counting tech. That should be plenty of time for an Elizabethan era dramatist, right? That depends. How well do you all know your sides? Yes, I don't know them that much. I mean, my arms cover them most of the time. He means your lines, Paul. You, Paul, who do you play? The soothsayer. What is your line? Armity, but not gone. Wait, no, no, that's, that's not it. You, the observer, who do you play? Uh, Cassius, sir. <laughs> Finish this for me. Men at some times are masters of their fates. But time is the longest distance between two places. What in God's name is that tripe? No, uh, that, that's Tennessee Williams. Gosh, I'm sorry. I, I must have been reading so many plays this semester. You, the dark and mysterious one, who do you play? Me? Of Brutus, your most magnificent liege. Give me your monologue from Act Three, Scene Two, in the Forum. Oh, yeah, no problem. Just performing a monologue for Shakespeare himself. Better not blow this one, Abigail. Man, so nerve-wracking. Not a time to forget your lines. Everyone else gets a line and I get a monologue, but whatever, this is no problem. Right, act three, scene two. Okay, okay, um, I know this. Don't worry, um, let's see. When I do it on stage, I normally have a cue. The noble Brutus has ascended. Silence. Thank you. Now I can begin the monologue. Monologue begins as such with the words I am going to say next. I am saying those words now. You don't know the monologue. I don't know the monologue. I'm so sorry. By a show of hands, how many of you feel you can get through an entire performance of the play right now and hit at least 80% of their lines? Dear Lord. You, Paul, you're not confident you can get your one line correct 80% of the time? It's trickier than it looks like on paper. 
I'm afraid I can't work like this. Two weeks is the bare minimum rehearsal time needed, and that's ten full days. You can push it with seven, but you're killing your actors at five, especially with such dense and lengthy text. Plus, if for any of it to work, the, arc, the actors must know the lines as a second nature. The play is too far gone, and we are far too few. We cannot escape the fact that the production is doomed. Aside from all that, the current direction is a mess, the cast is too paltry, and the script is too disjointed and hacked. I see no way Wait. of recovering. I did write a play once in college. Well, go on. It was a one-act play about a group of scientists stranded on a moon base. I never showed it to anybody. I was too much of a coward my whole life to ever do, ever do anything with it. Even when I was surrounded by actors in rehearsal spaces at Northwestern, that's why I keep trying to do the moon theme plays for so long. It's like any play I do, let's just, just set it on the moon for no reason. I've been obsessed with this thing my whole life. Wow, what a breakthrough. But I've never had the sand to put it up. I can't put my heart out there and suffer the slings and arrows, but I demand it from every actor I work with. Shakespeare's right. I'm a big phony. No, it's okay. Dry those eyes, pal. We love you, Erwin. Sybil? I've always considered you an associate of mine. Erwin, I know we've had our differences, but seeing you open up like this has given me so much more respect for you. Really? Yeah. Hey, it takes real courage to look into yourself and discover new things. I think this is the start of a wonderful journey for you. Wow, yeah. Uh, it, it does feel good to get it off my chest. <laughs> this play of yours, what is it called? Uh, the, the thing from Moonbase One. <laughs> Life is a tale told by an idiot. What are you thinking, Ghost of Shakespeare? Please, call me Will if we are to work together. Work together? Julius Caesar was my most glorious achievement. The jewel of the new globe, the critics named it. Queen Elizabeth herself told me personally that it was the most stunning and dramatic portrayal of Caesar's assassination she had ever witnessed. I was heralded as a rare talent. But was I so talented after all? Had I not simply regurgitated the most popular folk tale of the time? Didn't every single soul attending that play already know the beats of the story of the tragedy of Julius Caesar? I bet 50 ducats they did. I did nothing new then, just as Erwin does nothing new with my play now. Who am I to scold an other artists for not being original? We can all do better for the sake of our craft. If we are to attempt something new, then let it be fully so. Let us cast off the illusory cloak of concepts, the luggage of dead tales in dead tongues, for they make dull shovels. Let us dive fully into the world of ideas, brand new ideas that have never been dreamt before. Go, fetch the manuscript. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You're, you're talking about doing my play instead? Uh, forgive me, Owen. It is not my place to, to diminish your art. The way I see it, it is the play we must do in order to soothe your soul and mine. I think that's a great idea. Right, guys? Are we really talking about doing this? Yes, we can totally pull this off. What does everybody think? The costumes would actually make sense. Tina thinks it's cool. It, it must be cool. Sybil? As long as my role is comparable in size and importance to Julius Caesar. If I get stuck as a supporting character, I quit. In fact, I should have the biggest, most important role in the play. Then it's settled. I will serve as the ghost director, as it were, and Erwin shall focus his energies on the act of creation. Oh, and since everyone's being too squishy to say it, he needs to get the script into shape within a reasonable time for us to memorize it, Elizabethan-style production or not. Agreed. Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know, you guys. I, I mean, this is all 
so sudden. Uh, is is this something I really need in my life? Duh. Yes. Erwin. Yes. Told you so. The end of Act One. Hey. Alrighty. So uh, everyone, we're going to take a five minute intermission break. We will be back at three fifteen p.m. and we will dive right back into Act Two. So if you need to take a break. Do what you got to do. We'll be back in five. Bye. <laughs> Should I have like the the intermission music, like the Monty Python thing? Yeah, let's get the intermission <laughs> music going. I'll be back in forty five seconds, and I will do some more hosting stuff. <laughs> oh my god! Ah, <laughs> uh, hurry! Okay. <laughs> Thank you for our little intermission music. So before we begin, I'll go back and I'll just re-go uh, over everyone in the cast. So I am hosting, I am Michael Mankiewicz. Playing Tina is Grace Favaro. Playing Jen is Paige Cummings. Playing Abigail is Caroline Turner. Playing Sybil is our special guest, Natalie Steen. Playing Gloria is Bryce Edwards. Playing the role of Irwin is Sam Summer. Playing uh, Shakespeare is our second special guest, Laura Bird. And last but not least is our, uh, playing the role of Paul will be Quinn Potter. I hope everyone has been enjoying the show so far. And uh, in two minutes, we will be back for act two. If you are interested in donating for the entire month of June, all of our proceeds will be going to the Cleveland protest fund. So if you want to support us, this is who we are supporting. I hope you guys are enjoying. Hey, Mike. Yes. Hi, Sam. Hello. You should sing that song you were singing earlier. Oh, man. What a bop.
If any of you, uh, if any of you know that classic, please go ahead and sing it with me. <laughs> Even though I really don't remember the words, but I remember the rhythm, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a great show so far. I really like the show. Yeah, it's really fun. Oh, it is 3.15. Is everyone back? Do we have everyone here? Okay, looks like everyone is here, I believe. Let me just move this over. All right. Do we have Caroline, Bryce, and Grace here? Okay, Caroline, Bryce. <laughs> Now, Grace, are you here as well? If not, it's okay. Mike, while we're waiting, is there a is there a link? How do people actually donate? Oh, uh, Sam, would you like to go? <laughs> okay, it's uh, in the description right here, like on the Facebook post right here, right, right there in the description. Awesome. Beautiful. Yay. All right. All right, sweet, everyone's here. All righty, so it looks like we're gonna dive right back into act two. Here we go. Act two, scene one, setting, the house of the Tillman Theater. Before the next rehearsal on the following Monday, the stage has a few moon rock set pieces placed on it. At rise, Gloria Tillman is standing on one of the moon rocks inspecting the other set pieces, holding a mixed drink and a giant glass that she occasionally sips from. Erwin enters from one of the bombs head down, looking over his script as he strolls up towards the aisle on the stage. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I mean, Miss Tillman. Holy crud. Erwin. Surprised? N no, no. I uh, just didn't hear you come in, and we've had a problem with people showing up unannounced. Shut up and help me down. Erwin sets his script down on a nearby seat and assists Gloria off the moon rack as she shakily makes her way, putting most of her energy into balancing her drink. You're making me spill! It's spilling! Get off of me! Safely on the ground, Gloria rests herself away from Erwin and slaps him around like a purse with her purse like Ruth's buzzy. Don't touch me, you brute! You wholesome swine! Oh, ow, ow! Okay, oh, Gloria, okay! Did you bring that with you? If you must know, I ordered it at the pub across the street and then walked over here with it. Not one shred of guilt either. When you're filthy, stinking rich, you can take anything from anywhere and just walk out. They let you do it. I'm sure they want it back, Mrs. Tillman, and you're probably breaking a few laws. Now cut that shit, Owen. You know why I'm here. I do. I'm sure as hell hope so. Why am I here? You found out we switched plays? You switched plays! No more Julius Caesar. <laughs> I, I mean, shit. Julius Caesar was Mr. Tillman's favorite Shakespeare ditty. You absolute beast. You disrespectful brute. Ow, ow, okay, ow, Gloria. Stop. I was just about to call and tell you. That play was the only reason I gave you a sweetheart rate on my theater. Ah, uh, hey, come on. I thought... It was because I'm such a sweetheart. Don't flatter yourself. What on earth are these set pieces? There are spacesuits in the dressing rooms. Well, as you gathered, we're not doing Caesar anymore. We're doing a play I wrote that takes place on the moon. Are you out of your god? We open a week from Thursday. But not to worry. We're doing it Elizabethan style, and the actors are all game. I brought in a guest artist, a friend of mine, pro bono to help us pull it off and he's the best i actually spent the weekend getting the script polished and marking up all the tech cues it, it felt really good i like like i was doing productive work for the first time in a long time it's funny i i haven't touched this thing since college oh dear lord was sunk well, well hey me you haven't even read it maybe yeah so that's right i've never read it i never approved it Oh, but, but Gloria. Take advantage of an old widow and her money for your artistic beehives? I see how it is. Gloria, no, no, that's not how it is. Okay, okay, look. I'm gonna be straight with you. 
the ghost of William Shakespeare showed up at your theater and told us we couldn't do his play anymore. He insisted we do mine instead or he would curse us all. <laughs> That's the line for me. And there's plenty more where that came from, bucko. Okay, okay, let me put it another way. I know how important Mr. Tillman is to you. He's important to me too. But everyone in the cast felt that the production was, was not working. And we all agree that taking a completely different course was the best move. I mean, honestly, Gloria, I had no vision for Kaye's uh, or it, it was doomed to fail. I, I, and I want to make sure we're honoring your husband with something that comes from the heart. Mr. Tillman was a lover of the theater. He understood that good theater takes risks. It takes having faith. That's why he built this beautiful place. And, and that's why it's still standing today. A short pause. Then Gloria launches into another Ruth Buzzy attack. Oh, crossing bastard, insolent brute! I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm too rich to deal with problems like this. Yes, ma'am. Not that I'm considering approving this fiasco, but what is your play about? Well, it's, it's, it's called The Thing from Moon Base One, and it's about a group of scientists stranded on a moon base who encounter a thing of sorts. It, it's a little different and weird, but I think theater could benefit from more off-the-wall stories, don't you? Variety being the spice of life and all that. All I care about is butts in the seat stamped with dollar signs. Who's going to come see it? I don't know, Mrs. Tillman. <laughs> it's never been seen before. And that's the excitement of it. If, if we're all behind it, we might be able to make something great for you, something new. Wouldn't that be nice to have a, a big victory before you go out? Ugh, bad choice of words. Gloria finishes her drinks and then hands the glass to Irwin, who takes it like a busboy. You've made yourself a pretty pickle, Irwin. Gloria, I completely respect you and your money. Quiet. I will approve this disaster under one condition. You don't make some touchy-feely dedication to my husband. You make the play about him. What? You heard me. If you're going to go completely against everything we agreed upon, then I want some of the action. Uh, Mrs. Tillman, I, I don't know if that's going to work with what I got. In, in fact, I'm pretty dead certain that it won't. Your husband was a coal miner in the 40s. You do it my way, or you find someplace else to do it. I may also forget about that extra money you borrowed for your rent last month. But, but Gloria, it would change everything about the play. I'd have to start over from square zero. I just got the script into shape. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of work to do, Mr. Big Shot Playwright. And would you give me that back? They need it across the street. Gloria exits. Erwin mimes a gun to his head and blows his imaginary brains out. Paul enters, wearing a backpack. Oh, Paul, Paul, good, old, dependable, loyal Paul. Mr. Five Minutes Early is on time. <laughs> what do you need me to do now? Please, just give me a break. I marked up all the cues for you, but Gloria is making me change the play, like drastically. Go ahead and start writing them like we planned. Just keep in mind that everything may change at a moment's notice and you'll have to start over. <sighs> yeah, okay. Everything is under control. Oh, uh, but if you see Shakespeare, tell him I need to talk to him as soon as possible. I have to take care of some things backstage. So please, as soon as you see him, send him my way. Yep. You can't flake on this, Paul. We have no time as soon as he arrives. Soon. Okay, if I see him, I'll tell him you said hello. That I need to talk to him. That you need to talk to him. Yes, I got it. It's fine. I'll tell him. Go ahead. Everything is under control. You said that already. Well, it's doubly so. Erwin exits. Paul rolls his eyes and sits down at the light board with the script. Sybil enters, carrying a large rehearsal tote bag, with Jen following close behind her, carrying her own things and tapping Sybil's shopping list into her phone. Cocoa butter. I need cocoa butter. Two heads of broccoli. A bottle of pignon. I don't care. We're kind as long as it's over $20. Hummus and flatbread. Bullion cubes. Uh, simple syrup. Half a gallon of whole milk. This is the shopping list of my dreams. Paul, where's Erwin? I don't know. Backstage. 
Do you know if he has the scripts for us? I mean, he gave me this one. Give me that. <laughs> Temple snatches it out of Paul's hands and begins diving in. Hey, Paul. Hi, Jen. Um, Sybil. He's got to be kidding with this. Where, where did you say that he was? He went backstage, but I, I need that copy to write the cues. Erwin, stop hiding back there. Bree, write down Bree. Damn it, Bree. Excellent choice. Erwin, get up. Waiter. Double exits. Jen lingers apologizing to Paul for her. A pigeon pooped on her shoulder this morning. She's been pretty upset ever since. Well, it's no trouble. I, I need that script back. I'll see what I can do. Walnuts! Hello, walnuts! Uh, sorry, Sybil, do, do you want those crushed or whole? Paul dejectedly returns to the light board. Tina and Abigail enter, also arriving for rehearsal. They are in mid-conversation as they make their way down the aisle. They weren't doing anything? No, the guy just spit on them like and kept reading his paper like it was nothing. Holy crap. That was on the 7? On the 7. Right next to me. Wow. Nothing crazy like that ever happens to me on the subway. You guys talking about the subway? You know, I ride the subway. Oh, hi Paul. Nature is calling. See you guys later. Bye. Thanks for walking with me. Yep. Abigail exits, leaving Paul alone with Tina. So, all the tech stuff going okay? Must be pretty crazy with the whole show changing. Um. What's the matter? I didn't actually expect you to stay around to talk to me, so I have no idea what to say now. Well, with that attitude, you never will. Tina. Yes? I, uh, I, uh... What is it? I, I have to get changed. Your hair lo looks good. No, that's not what I wanted to say. That's... I have to go, Paul. Have a good rehearsal, okay? Uh, th Tina that... goes to exit. But, but, no, but I... Tina... <clears throat> idiot! Gah! Double idiot! Shakespeare appears on stage, leaning against the proscenium arch, Wrist, uh, wristfully looking upward. Fret not, Sira. I'm certain even the people living on the moon can find no solace for a broken heart. I'm sorry, what? Uh, the, the people living on the moon, even far out there. I'm sure there's no solace. Yes, yes, we went to the moon, but we just checked it out and came back. Nobody lives on the moon. Oh, and it's not made of cheese either. Astronomy existed in my day, believe it or not. You also craft in buckets, dude, no offense. There's that word again, dude. Why do you keep calling everyone dude? It's what people say in our time instead of saying Sira. When you want to say hello to a friend, you say, what's up, dude? What's up, dude? I like that, dude. Such a sweet morsel of a word, so smooth. That dude, hey dudes. Dude, 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 dude. Yes, that man is one rude, crude dude. You about done? Uh, forgive me, dude. Uh, shall we discuss your forlorn loins? Papa Will is here to help you with anything. Career, fortune, even women. Seriously? Paul, let us be friends. Okay. If I spill to you, promise you won't tell anyone? Dude, we share a sacred trust. Well... My life sucks, okay? I'm never gonna get someone like Tina to like me, let alone notice who I am. Nonsense. Write her a sonnet. Women love words. A quest of thoughts, all tenants to the heart, and by their verdict is determined. The clear eyes moiety and the dear hearts part, as thus. Mine eyes due is thy outward part, and my heart's right thy inward love of heart. That one of yours? Yes. Oh, that's nice, but I can't come up with something that good. A sonnet need not be good to win a woman's favor, only from the heart. Have you ever tried to write one? Well, no. Therein lies your first mistake. Get some paper, dude. All right. Oh, 
That reminds me, Erwin wanted me to tell you something. What was, what was it? Oh yeah, he wanted me to tell you, uh, he, he said hello. How very considerate of him. Were he here, I would say hello back. Let us begin. Shakespeare begins coaching Paul on writing the sonnet, talking secretively to where we can't hear them, whispering into each other's ears. As they continue their work, Erwin hurriedly enters the stage from the wings, trying to escape Sybil, who follows him in, trailed by Jen. Nobody notices Paul and Shakespeare working quietly in the house yet. Sybil, I don't have time for this right now. I am playing Dr. Sparrow or I'm not playing anything. No small part, Sybil, only small- Don't give me inspirational horse hockey. Give me lines. Give me a starring vehicle. I didn't just fall off the actor bus. <laughs> Remember to always insist on the big parts and don't take any shit from directors. Got it. Sybil, you are too old to play Sparrow. That's the deal. How could you say something so cruel? Uh, there, there. You weren't even supposed to see this, okay? It was a rough cut for Paul's sake. Fine. Why don't I just call it quits? Hm. You've made me completely irrelevant anyhow. Maybe we'd be all better off if I went and jumped into the East River. I could meet my career at the bottom. Hey, no, no, we love you, Sybil. Right, Erwin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was I thinking? Of course you can have Dr. Sparrow, Sybil. The role is yours. Only if it's what you want. Mm. It is so what I want. You deserve it. I will make those changes too sweet. You can count on it. Don't change your age. I can still play young. Yes, of course. <laughs> now, before I get more work thrown at me, has anyone seen Shakespeare? Yes! Excellent work, my boy. Uh, <laughs> hello. Hey, Paul. I see you found someone. Oh, hey guys, didn't hear you come in. Don't freak Irwin. I delivered your message. Yes. Chill out, dude. I'm helping Paul with the project. Ah, well, I don't mean to interrupt, dudes, but I've got a project over here too. You know, the play of mine, we all agreed to throw together in a week that you said you'd help me with. My apologies, I failed to note your arrival. Abigail enters from the wings, returning from the bathroom and observes the action. Yeah, and how is that possible, by the way, that you both didn't hear us come in? Did you guys take death pills? Offensive to the disabled? Not now, Abigail! Forgive us. We, we became enraptured by the muse. Yeah, likely story. You didn't notice us either. How could we notice you in the dark house? Uh, I noticed them right when we walked in. I assumed everyone else did too. Did, did you not notice them? No, I didn't. I didn't. I was too upset at Irwin. Listen. So I guess it's plausible that they didn't notice us and we didn't notice them. Stop! We didn't notice each other. Now we do. Nobody cares, okay? That's not my point. My point is I got Gloria throwing a wrench into the script. I got actors hounding me for changes before rehearsal even starts. And I got a stage manager who can't process simple instructions. So if you guys want a show to perform, everyone get off my back so I can talk to Will. Okay, you heard the man. Let's give him some room to think. Paul, we can finish our work later. Erwin. Papa Will is here. Talk to Papa Will. Oh, it's terrible, Will. Mrs. Tillman, she wants me to make her deceased coal miner husband a character in the play. Mrs. Tillman, she's the Gloria, I assume? Erwin's patron. Uh, she's a wealthy widower, runs a foundation in Soho. And she's her husband's theater, she owns the joint. And she's batshit nuts. She was just here and she hit me and threatened my livelihood. She's scary for an old lady. I couldn't stand up to her. I just cowered like a weakling. I just completely sold out my play and now we're all screwed. Your attention, dudes. It is safe to say that tonight's rehearsal cannot continue. My sincerest regrets, you were called from your homes for nothing, but Erwin and I have some work to do on the script. Please return home and rest, and I personally guarantee the play will be ready to go at our next scheduled rehearsal, which is, uh, Paul? Tomorrow night, same call. There you have it, plenty of time. So good night, everyone. Go home, be safe. Everyone except for Shakespeare and Irwin exit. 
Oh, God. What am I going to do? What now? Not to worry. Where there's a will, there's a way. Did you get that? I mean, will, like me. <laughs> will Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. I need a drink. Excellent idea. There's an old prop desk backstage. Go grab your folding writing contraption. My laptop? Yes, we'll set up shop right here. Shakespeare escorts Erwin backstage and they both exit, leaving the stage empty. After a beat, Tina enters dressed in her space suit. Friends, Romans, spacemen. <laughs> Kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, hello? Act two, scene two. Setting, the Tillman Theater later that night. At Rise, Erwin and Shakespeare are working on the script. It's hopeless, Will. We've been staring at this thing for hours. That must mean the answer is just around the corner. Stop saying things like that. We need ideas. Forgive me. It's, it's been quite exhausting catching up with the histories of coal mining and space travel. <laughs> I'm a man out of time. Okay, okay. We're both getting tired. We're losing our instincts. Let's do this. Clear your head. I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? And don't think at all. Just blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Yes, yes, proceed. How do we fix the play? Kittens. Terribly sorry. I'm usually better at this type of thing. <laughs> Just my luck. The one time I got William Shakespeare around to help me write a play, he's bringing his B game. And what B game have I brought? Dan dance among the honeycombs? What? Yes, go on. Make fun of a 400-year-old man who doesn't understand your references. I crap in buckets. I am an uncouth mongrel in this land. What merriment. Well, come on. I'm tired of not knowing half the things anyone is saying. I wish a pox on this age. Ugh. You're being overdramatic again. Am not. Oh, my words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Go on, write the bloody thing without me. Hey, that's it. What, doing it without me? No, 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 uh, Hamlet. Keep talking. What's the opening of Hamlet? Ghost of Hamlet's dad just shows up, right? Starts talking about who he is, what's going on. Continue. Well, I can steal or borrow that in my play. The thing haunting the space travelers is just this alien consciousness, a vague, spooky, generic offstage voice. <laughs> what if it wasn't so generic? Precisely. What if we made it a character, the ghost of Mr. Tillman? Then, instead of talking about the mysteries of the universe in some vague way, he could talk about his personal history as a coal miner. Yes! And it works with what you already have. The space travelers are there to mine the moon for rocks, are they not? Yeah, yes, yes, uh, oh, wow, that's it. That's the connection. That's why he's haunting the place, that's perfect. Huzzah! We cracked it, Will. <laughs> they jump around and celebrate until Shakespeare stops. In heaven's name, right, man. Strike now while the iron is hot. Shit, yes, yes. Um, scene one, the astronauts enter the mess hall and everyone's uneasy. Jen, Abigail, Tina, Sybil, and Paul all enter, dressed in their spacesuits, and begin acting out Irwin's writing in real time. Dr. Sparrow, the definitely not old, young, and brilliant commander, says... Anyone care to explain that voice I know we all heard? And Dr. Park, ever the doubter, says... I'm not sure what I heard yet. Then the ghost of Mr. Tillman speaks, but I'll, I'll need another actor. Allow me to play him. I can throw my voice after all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, do that crazy echoey voice you spooked us with. Uh, we hear Mr. Tillman's voice from off stage. All those who enter these moon mines shall suffer a terrible curse. Lights dim on Irwin and Shakespeare as the actors take center stage and continue acting out the play as Irwin types the dialogue. Let me guess, Dr. Park, you didn't hear that either. It could have been the moon base settling. Don't forget, Dr. Sparrow, this station is a hundred years old. Someone else has to believe me. Dr. Ainsworth, you're the world's most renowned biologist. Tell me, was that natural? Certainly not, Doctor. 
Doctors, please. I am the psychologist on this mission, and I want to avoid catching space madness. We're also here to figure out what happened to the last crew. This could be the key. Hold on, doctors. Yes, doctor. I'm reading the last log entry. Listen to this. The ghost, for lack of a better term, refuses to let us leave. We've lost two crew members already, Burke and Samson, to self-inflicted injuries. If anyone can hear us, Houston, SATCOM, Mayroll, anyone, please send help immediately. Lights rise on Irwin and Shakespeare again as the actors pause. Yes! Mystery, suspense, you're really baiting the bear now, Irwin. You don't think I'm using the word doctor too much? No use editing before it's done. Okay, okay, yeah. Um... You're anxious. Tell Papa Will. Eventually, we're going to have to meet this ghost in person. I've never been good at the payoff. Let us move on to that scene, then. We'll fill in the rest later. And you are in luck, because I love writing scenes where ghosts talk to people. Uh, right, no sweat. That's the spirit? Did you get that one? We were discussing ghosts? Yes, Will, you're very funny, but we've got work to do. Right. Right. As Erwin writes the next line, Abigail, Paul, Jen, and Tina exit, leaving Sybil on stage who acts out the new scene. Okay. New scene. Sparrow is in a, let's say, hallway on the base looking for an extra oxygen tank. Whatever. A, the ghost shows up and boom. Hit me, Will. By the fiery stones of Hades, I command you to halt. Back off! I've got a mining laser and I'm not afraid to use it! These, you, your minds are cursed. The glorious soul of Arthur Prescott Tillman forbids you to enter. Arthur Prescott Tillman, I've never heard that name. <laughs> ah, then bend an ear and you shall hear the wretched strife that is a miner's life. I was once Arthur Tillman, a humble coal miner from the American state of Pennsylvania. I built my very own mining company from the ground up, but alas, I succumbed to the black lung at the tender age of 87. No one shall enter the mine. What are you doing on Moon Base One? The coal reserves on Earth I doth exhausted, and in the spirit realm was accosted to protect the moon from a similar fate. Leave this Moon Base forever or your crew shall suffer the same fate. Lights rise up on Irwin again, who stops typing. Shakespeare rejoins him as the other actors freeze. Okay, okay, so Mr. Tillman starts picking off the astronauts one by one until only Dr. Sparrow is left. She's the last girl, that's all well and good, but there is still the question of how it ends. The ending is everything. Agreed, it is the final punctuation. So how does it end? Verily, I do not know. Here, let's try you. Don't think, clear your head. I'll ask you a question and you just shout out the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, okay. How do we end the play? Supply side economics, what? I'm not sure we're doing exercise correctly. Great, uh, well, I don't know then, maybe I wrote myself into a corner. This can't, I, I mean, I can't lose another day on the script. The script has to be finished tonight. Help me, Will, help! Erwin, peace, calm. I may only be bringing my B game, but you don't have to be on the royal jelly to know that what we do is an act of discovery. So be not afraid of the darkness. Reach out into it. Embrace it with loving arms. Summon the courage, not from here, but from here. It needn't be spectacular or even good. The human heart does not know good or bad, only alive or dead. Okay. Off we go. Act two, scene three. Setting, the Tillman Theater, one day before opening night at the final dress rehearsal of Irwin's show. At Rise, Sybil and Shakespeare are performing the final scene of The Thing from Moonbase One with full costume and tech for Irwin, who now watches from the seat like a proud papa. I'm gonna blow the place up and me with it. That will not break the curse. It may not, but it's a risk I am willing to take, ready to find out if you're wrong. No, 
Stop. I can go no further. I must apologize for killing your entire crew. My heart is empty, for I never made amends. My one true love, the glorious Gloria Tillman, suffered by my obsession with mining. Her absence will forever leave a stain on my soul. I can go no further without her, so I cannot let you go any further. As a ghost, I am nothing. Without love in my life, I am less than nothing. This is the only reliable path to truth I will ever know. That is so beautiful, Mr. Tillman. You've taught me more than I thought I could learn in a lifetime. I, I choose to end my travels here with you in honor of Gloria. I'm through with this world anyway. Science has failed me. I want to join you and become one with the universe. You, we can meet Gloria again together. Then let this be the final transmission from Moon Base One. And scene. Thermonuclear bomb goes off. Erwin hits a button on the control board and SFX of an explosion fills the theater along with flashing red lights and ends in blackout. Shakespeare and Tina exit in the darkness. Everyone come out for curtain call. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> That's it, gang. I think we're ready to open the sucker. Author! Author! <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for bearing with me during this process. I, I know it's been hectic. I think it's been a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Or when the script you and William Shakespeare came up with is brilliant. Well, brilliant is an overused word. <laughs> Come on, Sybil, don't listen to her, Erwin. No, 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 no. It's all part of the process. What does that mean? I think what Sybil is trying to say is that it has a lot of potential. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying it's far from brilliant. Wow, thanks. Sybil. Oh, come on, we're all thinking it. It's a little rough, but that's not a bad thing. Please, no, you guys, Shakespeare, what do you think? And be honest. Um, nothing is good or bad. Only thinking makes it so. Don't give me that crap. <laughs> Someone had to have an unqualified opinion on it. Abigail, help me out here. You know, no play is ever really finished. Ah, uh, Christ! No, Erwin, it's not that bad. Yeah. Lord have mercy, what have I done? Here we go. Who am I kidding? This is an unmitigated disaster. It's corny and nothing makes sense. Why didn't I just stick with something that works? He's the playwright. I'm the director. What was I thinking? Don't give up now. You've got to grab onto this tiger and ride it, Erwin. Ride the tiger. Screw the tiger. I don't know that tiger. Why is he hassling me for a ride? This is my reputation on the line here. It's my whole name. I believe there's a good lesson in all this. Yeah. I should never touch a keyboard ever again. Some people are bound to get it. Yeah, but what if they don't? It's art, dude. It's okay if they don't. I hear what all of you are saying. I really do. But I think the best thing will be for me to escape to Canada on a tramp freighter and start over completely. Oh, don't talk like that. Your problems are right here. It's only a little feedback, Erwin. Grow a pair. <laughs> Everyone, leave me alone. Excellent work, everyone. Please make your way home, get plenty of rest, and take all the preparation time you need for tomorrow's performance. Call is still six. Six o'clock, post-meridian. You heard my main dude over here. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Oh, and don't worry about Erwin. I'm sure he'll be fine. I should go check on him, however. <laughs> Shakespeare exits, pursuing Erwin. Did he really say, ack, like Kathy from the comic strip? He's under a lot of pressure. Anyone want to get a drink? Sybil? Yes, at my apartment in my tub. Oh, can I join? No, but you can come over and pick up the dry cleaning, my dear. And while you're there, I need a pedicure. My fingers are not the best either. Why, this won't do for opening night. Let's make it a full mani-pedi. Sounds good. Sybil exits. Good night, I guess, you guys. Jen, everything okay? 
Yeah, I'm fine. Just tired. Bye, Paul. See you guys for opening. Bye, Jen. Get some sleep. Jen exits. This play is turning into an existential crisis. I am going home to make myself some hot soup. Okay. See you then, Abigail. Great work tonight. You too. Later, Tina. Bye. So, um... Yes? What is it? Your eyes are like, can I read this? I, I, I wrote this for you. Your eyes are like pools of gravity. Lo, in an endless garden is all I see. Your eyes fill my soul to, soul to capacity. Where I was once blind, your eyes make me see. Cast the chains off my spurious heart. Allow me to admire your beauty and art. Your eyes unlock all these things and more for me. Let us spend some time slowly waiting. Let us spend time contemplating. Let us be together as time is fading. Share not your heart with me in and en- share not your heart with me in en- enmity that I might fall into orbit around these precious pools of gravity. That was it. You wrote that for me. Yeah. Let me see it. Not that I like it or anything, but how long have you been wanting to do this? Since I met you. Paul, I don't know if you know this, but I am infatuated or whatever with Irwin. Yeah, but you're just enamored with your mentor and stuff. What? I'm, no, I'm not. How can you say that? Don't tell me how I feel about things, okay, Paul? Tell me how you feel about things. Well, I mean, it's a nice sonnet and everything, but I, I, I don't know. What, what do you want me to do here, Paul? Nothing. Take it home. Put it on your fridge. I never thought of you that way before. I've never been good at poetry and stuff, but for you, I figured I'd give it a shot. See you opening night. Yeah, see you. Psst, Tina, not to ruin your moment or anything, but you should know I, I wrote the majority of those lines. He kept rhyming the same words twice. He worked tirelessly on it, but, the most florid parts, or the best parts, really, were all me. I think his heart is bigger than his chest can handle. <laughs> He's a fine young dude, however. I personally vouch for him. I want off! I want off now! Thank your pardon? Uh, bye, William. <laughs> See you at opening. Um, bye, Erwin. Tina exits. After a beat, Erwin re-enters, carrying his pack satchel, trailed by Shakespeare. Wait, now see here! Sorry, Will. I gotta shut the dream down. I'm calling Gloria and telling her that it's all over. I can't take it. I can't take the pressure. I'm bailing. You can tell the cast sorry for me. Sorry that I can't pay them. Sorry that I can't do anything right. Erwin, Erwin! Listen to Papa Will. You've taken it this far. Don't self-sabotage now! No, no, no. I've gotta call her. I've gotta call her. I've, I've, I've... I'm making another mistake. This is crazy. What am I doing? Oh God, I hate myself. I hate who I started out as and I hate who I've become. This is pathetic. No one is going to like my idiotic play. I know nothing about life. I've always been too scared of it. What could I possibly tell others about it? Get hold of yourself, man. Rule one of the theater is the show must go on. Rule one of life is we all must go on. Look at me. Some say I'm dead. Have been for centuries. Does life care? Should I? Does anything really matter when you get to the nut of it all? No. It's all meaningless. Then take a risk. It's worth it, Erwin. It's noble and it's good. Let go and be free. Do it now or life will continue on without you. Ugh, God. This is the worst feeling in the world. This moment, like right 
before you open a play that you wrote is it's the worst feeling in the world. I seriously want to puke. My son, you are now a playwright. Act two, scene four. Setting, the theater about a half an hour, a half an hour after opening night. At rise, Irwin wanders the aisle, satisfied with himself after the performance. Gloria enters. I must say I'm impressed, Irwin. I was certain this would be a spectacular failure. <laughs> Turns out it was only a modest failure. Hi, Gloria, glad you came. Yeah, not a very full house for opening night. Hopefully it will pick up. And who is that young man playing my Arthur? He was dreadful. Oh yeah, William. Sh He's just some guy we found at the last minute. Yeah. So wooden and stiff, poor casting. Well, he's a good kid. We've had our differences, Owen, but deep down in the dark recesses of my craggy heart, you've made this bitter old widowed socialite somewhat happy. Do you think Arthur would have liked it? Oh, God, no. <laughs> but it was nice to see somebody give a shit about him. And I know that I come off as bitter, controlling, and severely out of touch, but you know that I'm not completely awful. Hey, the Tin Man got a heart. Now watch it, bucko. I rarely make myself vulnerable, and this may be the last time you see it. Of course. <laughs> All kidding aside, what you said really means a lot to me, Gloria. Thank you. You're welcome. We lost a little money on this one, and we will continue to lose money until it closes. So now that you've sowed your wild oats, I expect that the next one will be something a bit more familiar. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I got whatever was weighing me down off my chest. I'm ready to do some good work for you. Maybe I can finally get a grip on Kaiser. <laughs> Who knows? You're a creative young man, Owen. I saw early on. Uh, when you first proposed this venture, I knew that you had the magic, the spark of invention. <laughs> I've always had faith in you, even if I didn't always show it. Thanks. That's really nice of you to say. But if you ever have anything new to do in the future, let's workshop it at my place and then develop it right away. No more of these silly lies about ghosts and hauntings. No more stopping and starting. No more half choices. Be on the right track you've chosen and be happy with it. Take it from an old bird who's been in lots of cages. Me and my overactive imagination. <laughs> Won't happen again, Gloria. Take these for you and your motley crew. Oh, uh, Gloria, I mean, I ate the salary budget long ago and we didn't even cover my initial fee with ticket sales. Don't go soft on me, Owen. I'm not demented and it's only money. You deserve it and so does your cast. Quite honestly, I don't know how... I don't know what to do with all of Arthur's money except try to fill my heart with it. Consider it a down payment on future success. Okay then, uh, thank you. I know they're all going to be thrilled to find out. Oh, if you'd like, I will buy everyone dinner across the street as a sort of opening night celebration. Oh, Gloria, that would be really kind of you. Gather your rastabouts and tagalongs and meet me there. Hmm? You're a wonderful person, Gloria. Take all the time you need, but make it quick. An old bag like me can't stay out all night. Gloria exits. Erwin smiles to himself and looks up at the fly rails wistfully as Tina enters. Oh, I'm fortune's fool. <laughs> Hi, Tina. Great work tonight. You know, I really believe the terror you brought to your death scene. One guy even stood up and clapped at the end. Thanks. I worked extra hard on that. I wanted to say good job and thank you, Erwin. I'm never gonna forget this show or you. Well, I hope you don't become a stranger after the run. I could use your talents. <laughs> hey, anything you're doing, I'm there. <laughs> hey, Erwin. Paul, excellent work, man. A pleasure. Yeah, Erwin, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going out with Paul tonight. Honestly, Tina, and don't take this the wrong way, I never minded it. Oh, okay. You're sure? Positive. You're young and everything's new, so do what makes your heart happy. Leave the serious problems to us old guys. 
That's beautiful. You really are a poet, Erwin. Well, I'm no Shakespeare. Hey, if you see if you see Shakespeare, tell him thanks. He's a solid dude. You guys didn't see him? He like vanished. You think he went back to his home planet? He's from Earth, Paul. I'm, I'm going to go look backstage for him. You guys hang tight, okay? I have announcement for everyone. Erwin exits. Paul and Tina go sit in the house. Sybil enters the stage from the wings, followed by Jen. Abigail also enters apart from them and sits in the house, depressed. How do you think the show went? Did you see the house? Nobody cares to show up to a Sybil Danning play anymore. It's, it's bound to pick up over the weekend. No, no, it's a disaster. Play an astronaut in her 20s? What was I thinking? You were wonderful. No, it's enough. I've had it. I have an announcement. I am formally retiring from acting effective immediately. No! Sybil, you have so much more to offer. You're very naive, which is nice, but I have to face it. My fans abandoned me long ago. This performance was the final nail in the coffin, but there must be a reason I was nominated seven times, but never won a Tony. I am a failure. Hey. You still got one fan left? By that I mean me, Jen. I know that, but I know it must be intoxicating to be with me all the time, Jennifer, but I take advantage of you. I've had a bad temper and I drink my dinner every night. You should run before I drag you down with me. You're too young and beautiful. Sybil, you don't understand. Moving to New York, doing this show and meeting you, it like a dream come true. You you made my dreams come true. Really? Really? You shouldn't be so negative about your performances. I heard literal gasps in the crowd on some of your monologues. You still got it. That was quite good, wasn't I? <laughs> Simply the best. Oh, Jen, do you really mean it? I would never lie to you, Sybil. You sweet, innocent thing. How about I do your dry cleaning for a month? Oh, don't be silly. I love doing your dry cleaning. Let me do everything for you today. You had a very emotional evening. How about a drink instead? I can tell you how David Schwimmer is in the sack. Yes, that would be amazing. I couldn't find Will back there, gang, but I do- I have a second announcement. Okie doke. I hereby announce my unretirement from acting so that I may continue sharing my exquisite gifts with the world. Hey, all right. Let's give her a hand, everyone. <laughs> Didn't even know you had retired, so that's great news. Can I make my announcement now? Erwin, the stage is yours. Thanks. I uh, just wanted to, you guys to know that the astounding Mrs. Tillman gave us bonus checks. <laughs> she also invited us all to dinner across the street on her as a way to say thank you. So I know some of you have plans, so let's vamoose and get some food before she changes her mind. <laughs> Everyone laughs and begins to file out through a vom. You there, Erwin? Yep, uh, I'll catch up in a minute. I thought the show went well. Neat play. Thank you, Abigail. Life is short, confusing, and strange. You read my mind. Is Shakespeare coming back for the rest of the shows? Hope so. I suppose his work here was done. Is, is this how this type of thing goes? I, I don't know. I, I can play the part if he's gone, though. I'm not. I'm through stressing about my art. It should be easy if my whole heart is in it. You know, Erwin, I was completely wrong about you. Yeah? Yes. I'm the one with issues. I push people away. You're a hell of an actress, Abigail. And regardless about how you feel about it, you were still right. I was holding on to a lot of anger, regret, and hostility, clinging to old dreams and not taking a risk to, on new ones. I, I should have listened, so all is forgiven. Sorry our relationship has been so awkward up until this point. It's not awkward. Self-discovery is one of the most important things one can do in life. In fact, I'm working on my own one-woman show called The Day My Vagina Swallowed Me Whole. That sounds fascinating. Really. 
would you be interested in helping me develop it? I mean, since you've worked with William Shakespeare before. I'd like that a lot. You know, Abigail, you really challenged me and I, I need that in my life. I don't rise to the occasion enough and I wanna change that. I need to stop trying to take things apart with my time, like my life and other people's choices and start creating more and making some good choices of my own. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> How about I have Mrs. Tillman buy us both a drink across the street, and we'll talk more about it? Sounds like a perfect end to an amazing night. Go on ahead. I'll, I have to lock up. Don't be long. Erwin goes off stage, shuts the lights in the theater off, then returns, wheeling out the ghost light and ensuring it's left on goes to exit. Owen! Well, hey, hey man, where'd you go? You took your bow and then I couldn't find you in the dressing room. I was returned to the afterlife, but they sent me back. Something about having to wrap up things with you. <laughs> Guess the world's best playwright couldn't leave without a dramatic exit. Am I the world's best, Owen? Almost every day of my life on earth, I consider myself a failure. No play ever felt fully finished. So many problems left unresolved. I can believe that. But hey, who cares? Absolutely nobody. And I'm not referring to Homer's ruse with the Cyclops. <laughs> um, everyone in my time would have understood that reference, but no matter. The show, were you satisfied? Yeah. Happy with your work? As much as I can be. <laughs> That's all one can ever hope for. I had a fine time writing with you, Owen. Thanks for letting me stretch my theater legs one more time. No, great job, Will. I, I mean, everything they say about you, it, it's all true. It was my pleasure. Sorry I called you a dick. Sorry I called you a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like a fool. Time makes fools of us all. So take it easy on yourself, dude. <laughs> you got it. Uh, you'll cover my role in the play? I'm not leaving any dudes hanging, am I? We'll be fine. <laughs> even if we have to make a few changes here and there. Splendid. Godspeed. And always remember, to thine own self be true. Goodbye, William. Good knowing you. Hmm. Really thought I would have returned by now. <laughs> I did not know what they need exactly. <laughs> thought that was a solid farewell. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I guess... If I could add something, it's that we all feel like frauds every now and again, and it's not a Shakespearean tragedy. At least it doesn't have to be. It's just life, and it just happens. And when it does, you've got to make a choice and live with it. So true. So very true. I've been thinking, Owen, from all the fractured romances I witnessed among your cast, we've all forgotten how to love. We all must find it in our hearts to let go of our regrets and move forward. Oh, great. Now they take me back when I get cooking on a good soliloquy. Uh, moving forward into the beautiful expanse of discovery and listen to your restless heart for it knows what... Oh, forget it. I'm fading fast here. Can you even hear me? My voice sounds airy and hollow over here. Does it sound that way to you? Oh, well, it was only probably my greatest speech ever, but I guess the theater gods have a sick sense of timing. Goodbye, Erwin. Tell everyone goodbye. I can't come back. I don't know how it works. Goodbye, folks. Goodbye. And scene. Lights go to blackout. The end. Yeah. Well, that was our show. <laughs> Everyone come back in. A huge round of applause or virtual applause to all of our wonderful cast members. This again was Shakespeare in the Dark, written by Adam Harrell. I'm gonna go through the cast list one more time, just as like a little bow. So uh, playing Tina was Grace Favaro. Playing Jen was Paige Cummings. Playing Abigail was Caroline Turner. Playing Sybil was the special guest, Natalie Steen. Playing Gloria was Bryce Edwards. Playing Irwin was Sam Summer. Playing William Shakespeare was our other special guest, Laura Berg. And playing Paul was Quinn Potter. And I am your host, Michael Mankiewicz.
Um, next week, Sam, would you like to talk about what we're oh, doing next week? Sure. Uh, let me pull up the full name so I can get it right. Uh, it is called, next week's show is called Awkward Robots Instruction Manual for Dating Other Awkward Robots by Matthew Weaver. And uh, that's the show, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I hope you have the great rest of your weekend, and uh, we will see you next week. All right. All right. Bye.